Namaste. So today I want to talk about something that came up in the comments last night. Richard Elm made a very, very nice observation that he sees people around him taking drugs and theogens and not using them with right view. In fact, using them with wrong view. And they don't get any spiritual results. Of course. It's just like if you have a sound system. You have a source, like a record player, video, or whatever. And then you hook that up to an amplifier. The amplifier makes the signal stronger so it can run the speakers. So what comes out of the speakers is not the fault of the amplifier. <laughs> Whatever you play on the sound source is going to be the program. Uh, the amplifier has no <laughs> responsibility in the matter. It just makes the signal stronger no matter what it is. Similarly, entheogens are amplifiers. They amplify certain brain processes and suppress others. Each one is different. Each one is only a tool, an amplifier. So it depends on what you use it for whether you get any spiritual results or not. Now, I'm not arguing that everybody should take entheogens. Or, actually, I'm not arguing that anybody should. I took them back in the day. And I did inhale <laughs> and swallow it too. But now I'm getting the same or better results from ordinary meditation. Why is that? Because now I'm practicing with right view. I didn't have right view before. That's why I forgot, if you've seen the last few episodes, I forgot that I had a tremendous enlightenment experience in my like second or third acid trip back in 67. <clears throat> I forgot about it. I had to repress it because I didn't have the background to interpret it in a, a helpful way, only in a negative way. Oh my God, I'm losing my ego. We're all afraid of that. You know, we all start out with a certain idea. Yeah, I'm gonna to come to the material world, I'm gonna be somebody, huh? Like that guy, the, the rat fink in the Matrix, who told the agents where, the, where the, uh, the city was. And he's talking to Agent Smith and he says, I, I just want to be somebody important. <laughs> it's like he doesn't care who or what. And we're all like that. We all want to be important. We all want to be significant. We all want to matter to others. And there's where the problem comes in. Because others are also individuals. They have their own desires, their own agendas, their own set of meanings that they project on the situation. So others are always going to interpret our actions differently than we do. So you know where that leads. Babble. <laughs> Everybody's talking at each other or past each other, and nobody really understands what anybody else means. Well, in a way, that's inevitable because they're using words, and words are defined according to context, and everybody's context is different. But this is the existential anomaly. That everybody comes here because they want to be know, do, and have certain things. 
and they judge themselves by their ability to think, know, become, do, or have. Not only that, others judge us according to their ideas, their values that they project on the different things you can be, do, think, have, know, whatever. So we get in a conflict situation. We get in a, what's that called? Cognitive dissonance situation where what we are in the world is not what we really want to be. It's what others paint us. So we put an enormous amount of time, effort, and worry into trying to become what we think others will admire, will approve of, will support. But in the process, we lose who we really are, who we really want to be. So we're in enough trouble, you know what I'm saying? Just living up to our own <laughs> expectations. What to speak of others whose values and purposes and goals may be completely different. It's an impossible situation. So one traditional way to deal with it is to drop out, to become a monk, a sannyasi, a baba, a religious person on some level. You know, you wear the costume, wear the uniform, salute the flag, <laughs> whatever, whatever it might be. Huh? <clears throat> So you have a community, you have a default set of people that you have permission to interact with intimately. But if the truth were known, all of these communities are imposing an external set of values on people and on themselves. And imposing an external set of values on you is exactly what you don't want if you're going to attain self-realization. Because it's about yourself, not about anybody else. And that's why often sadhus become recluses. I have, myself, I admit it. Out of difficulty of finding people whose views are harmonious enough with mine to be comfortable with. And a lot of that is my fault because I had invested heavily in classical spiritual culture and values. And because of that, I eliminated a class of people from having access to enlightenment because of their activities, huh? taking drugs or believing in some trash nonsense, according to my values. Now, unfortunately, <laughs> that group, that class of people also included myself, because I had, in a past life, <laughs> taken drugs and done all these things that according to classical religious spiritual doctrine, are wrong. Yet, due to the fact that I had an authentic enlightenment experience in 67, I was able to attain the goals of these various spiritual practices in a very short time. Because in truth, I had actually already attained it. All I really needed to do was learn how to articulate those insights in the language and behavior that the group understands. And this is how people get hooked into groupthink. And I admit, I did too. It helped me because I needed a framework to understand the experience that I had at a very tender age that was completely beyond me. 
<laughs> beyond my background, beyond my ability to articulate even to myself. <laughs> but I was able, by refining my background more and more through different experiences, different learnings, I was finally able to comprehend that early experience and others that I had later in a light that put them in an orderly and lawful series of advancements. I'm talking about the Chatur Darshanam here, the four views given by Shankaracharya, and also the other scales, similar scales invented by the Buddha, <clears throat> like the eight jhanas, and some of the processes, like we just read that sutta, the shorter sutta on emptiness, Chuli Shunyata Sutta. And that is also a graded series of experiences, more or less in parallel with the eight jhanas, that also brings you to enlightenment. See, there's no one door. There's 86,000 doors, according to the Buddha. I don't think we've explored but a small subset of those, even with all the alternative optional processes that sometimes more or less accidentally give results. See, because of confirmation bias, we want to say that any process that gives results sometimes is a good thing and is something you should learn and do. But statistically, any particular process only works for a limited subset of people who are predisposed in that way. It has to be like this because any, any inflexible dogmatic theory is going to have edge cases and also cases that are completely outside of its domain, its ontological domain. So there's always going to be this cognitive dissonance when people show up who, for example, claim to have certain insights related to enlightenment, but have not followed any of the approved uh, socially structured processes and, and phenomena and symptoms and vocabulary that's expected. Consequently, none of these organizations built around these doctrines can recognize a person who attained enlightenment spontaneously, no matter how or in what condition they attained it. Some good examples. Da Fri John attained spontaneously while sitting in the Kalima temple of the uh, SRF, I think it was, in Hollywood, West Hollywood, <laughs> back when it was still like Beverly Hills. And because of that, then he founded a whole organization. But he never recognized any of the people in his organization as being enlightened, at least to my knowledge. Let me know if I'm wrong. He never recognized any of his followers. In fact, he used to almost daily berate them for being such assholes that they couldn't attain enlightenment, even, with, even by hanging around him. <laughs> Great. Huh? So every sectarian religion, no matter how liberal its views, will always have limits. And because its values are imposed from the outside, it actually, in a way, discourages, or it discourages full self-realization, right? It may facilitate partial self-realization, and for that matter, they're valuable. But a person like Ramana Maharshi, who attained spontaneously at 16 years old, or a person who, like myself, had a profound insight at an early age in a drug trip. Huh? 
Are we ever candidates to be admitted to the Orthodox fold? No, not really. Not if they knew the truth about the things that we had done and what we claim to have gotten from it. So, <laughs> they lose out on a whole category of people. Now I'm saying, it's certainly true that for each orthodox path to enlightenment, there are certain people who become enlightened because of it. I think. <laughs> huh? I mean, I met several enlightened Buddhists, Buddhist monks, and they were as orthodox as could be externally. But internally, <laughs> they were completely radical and outside the box. So, and the same within the Hare Krishna organization that I was in for many years. There were a few who really were enlightened because of it, uh, because it fit their natures. But the vast majority of Catholics, Hare Krishnas, Muslims, Hindus, or whatever, are not, don't get enlightened by their religion. Because A, it's imposed from outside, and B, it doesn't fit them, it doesn't suit them. But then there are all these other people who are not part of any religious organization, or if they are, it's only superficially. Within, they're completely independent and self motivated. But they've attained enlightenment in ways that don't match any of the scripts. And they don't wear a costume <clears throat> or take a name or whatever. What about them? Are we going to just lose them? Are we going to write off their value to society? Are we going to go into denial and say, no, they're not enlightened, even though they can talk a blue streak, they can articulate their realizations, they can even show symptoms in the right settings. Are we just going to let them go? Or are we going to value them properly and behave with them appropriately and give them the status they deserve, not for their enjoyment, but because of the example that they pose? See, now we have so-called leaders who pose a terrible example, terrible in terms of facilitating the growth of the human race and society in general. Well, why don't we have leaders who, even though they may be not so competent politically, <laughs> but they're good human beings, see? Why can't we, and they don't need to have any official position. They probably wouldn't take one even if you offered it to them. But they're not going to stop you if you stand back and say, hey, this guy knows his shit. This guy's the real thing. There's no law against that. And given the internet, you can even do it anonymously. So why not? Why not? give a vote of confidence and support for those people that you know who have gotten somewhere, who have made it. And it might be yourself. Or it might be someone around you who is enlightened or advanced in insight, but unrecognized, unsung. See, that's, that's what you can do, even if you're not enlightened, even if you don't know anything about it. Huh? And when you see somebody who's walking the walk, give them <clears throat> the support to also talk the talk and to help others. Om Tat Sat. Buddha Saranai.